and welcome to this review of my Deco Fast Action Keyboard. Those of you who like big keyboards, this is your lucky day. This titanic, towering colossus of a keyboard is at the moment the biggest keyboard I own. At 58 centimeters wide, it's slightly bigger even than an IBM Battleship, which is basically the thing I pull out to show how small other keyboards are. But not this one. If you're one of those space-saving 60% keyboard users, here's what the Deco looks like compared to an IGK-61. Just to give some perspective on this, note that it doesn't even reach the Enter key. Now, despite its giant size, metal chassis and full metal pan that the whole assembly sits in, the whole keyboard weighs surprisingly little, a bit under 2.6 kilos, and that's because all the metal parts appear to be aluminium. Which is nothing to scoff at, of course, but it does mean that this mastodontic piece of work actually weighs less than this thing. Still, it's pretty well built, you know, a keyboard of which most of the internals are fairly thick aluminium and which has a pretty substantial plastic top case on it should last a while. A little bit of history, Deco is a family of products that are now owned by Avid Technology, a company most well known for the Media Composer video editing suite, which I've been told is basically the one Hollywood runs on. The fast action keyboard was the keyboard that came with Deco character generator systems, which are a type of machine that can edit text into a video stream. A character generator is not quite the same as a video editing system, although the differences nowadays are getting smaller. Based on the logo plate, which is an older model, I'm guessing it came from a Deco 550 system. One thing that often visually differentiates character generators from video editing keyboards is that the latter tend to have very colorful keycap sets, while character generators don't have that, they just tend to have a buttload of buttons. I've previously shown a competitor, the Chiron Aircraft Carrier, which is by far the heaviest keyboard I own, and if you count the depth, it actually has a bigger footprint too, at 1620 square centimeters. This was also a character generator keyboard, although the later Duet keyboard, which was also a Brobdingnagian piece of work, would have been a more contemporary competitor to the fast action. Unfortunately, like the Chiron and many other of these specialist keyboards, they are not compatible with modern computers. This one uses an AvoCent KVM to make it work, so I think it's going to be very hard to actually use, which is a shame, obviously. I tried plugging it in through its PS2 port to see if it would show any bare-bones functionality, but no dice, unfortunately. It also has a DC power input socket, probably for use with that KVM. At 162 buttons, two more even than the Ski Data keyboard, it has more buttons than any other single commercial Western keyboard that I know of. I'm sure there exist ones that have more, but if you disqualify entire consoles, there won't be a lot. A huge amount of the keycaps on the Deco have lock lights in them, and these are much shallower than normal keycaps too. Maybe it's to differentiate them more easily from the F keys. Speaking of which, apart from the ABS spacebar, all the keycaps are PBT and blindingly brilliantine white like an American's teeth, with die sublimed lettering, and as you can see, this keyboard shows very strong smudging of the legends, which is probably caused by diffusion of the die further into the material. I'm still not sure what causes this diffusion, but I've seen it before, and it's a good example why even die sublimation as a printing method is still not as durable or as high quality as double shot injection molding. The caps are MX mount though, so you could technically use them on another keyboard if you so desired. That said, they don't appear to be the same as the OG Cherry die subs, which always go for a small fortune. These caps and the lettering are thinner, and the font is Helvetica rather than Cherry standard 90s one. And this brings us to the switches, which are Cherry MX Black. Ha <laughs> ha! Bet you didn't expect that. Uh, oh wait, it's in the title. I've mentioned it several times before, but even though Cherry MX Black is one of the most boring switches out there in my opinion, they did appear on a large number of very cool keyboards, which is highly ironic. I've reviewed Cherry MX Black several times, although the last time was quite a while ago. They were the original design in the Cherry MX series of switches, and all other MX switches were designed as variations based on this switch. They are linear switches with a moderately stiff weighting of 60 grams of force at actuation. 
I really don't like these at all. Although I'm a big fan of good linear switches, MX Black are too stiff for me. I prefer light weightings for linear switches myself. These aren't quite so heavy that I get cramps immediately, but after prolonged use they do become fatiguing for me. In addition, they feel scratchy and unpleasant. It's one of my least favourite types of MX switch, although of course that's just an opinion. As is often the case for these old boards, the spacebar is a stiffer switch to prevent accidental actuation. In this case, it's MX Linear Grey, which actuates at 80 rather than 60 grams of force. Being a specialist keyboard, it has a bunch of uncommon legends, but surprisingly, none of them are particularly weird. I mean, there's no yours or mine buttons, no slinky button, no Obama button, or even a good old rub out key. It's just things like font, sequence edit, macro edit, preview program, read preview, read program, you know, all fairly sensible stuff. I wish I could make fun of a few weird ones, but it's just really all kind of normal-ish. The keyboard actually looks pretty cool overall, I'd say. Not super elegant or refined, but definitely imposing, and I can imagine it's even cooler with a dozen or so of these blinking lights on. Way better than RGB, guys. If you'd managed to convert and program it, the possible bounty of macro buttons would be quite tempting. There's around 60 keys in total all over the board that you could easily program, and beneath all that you'd still have a fairly standard modern 101 key ANSI keyboard left. Also, I'm quite sure that those built-in LEDs could be quite useful as status indicators for some applications, and even if not, it surely can't hurt to have them. There's a little screen as well, but I don't know what it does. I imagine it'd be very hard to program it to do what you want, though. Anyway, apart from the switches, which I don't like myself, I think this would make a pretty cool keyboard if I got this up and running. Of course, if I didn't have a way to program all the extra keys, they would just be in the way and I'd rather have a normal full size. But with such a host of potential macro keys, it'd make a fantastic workhorse. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.